My name is Mark Studley. I am the project lead for an open source Java virtual machine project called Eclipse Open J9. And um, I work at IBM in Canada. And I'm really happy to be here, not just because we've had lots of great talks and lots of great speakers to listen to at this conference, but because I left be home, be behind at home six inches of snow on my driveway and a traffic <laughs> nightmare. Um, my wife, who's now in charge of shuttling my daughter around to school, is not quite so happy about this situation. <laughs> and so that's an example of two people applying a very different trade-off to the exact same situation and coming to a different conclusion about what's good and what's not so good. <laughs> so in this talk, I'm actually going to talk about that same subject. Um, I'm going to try to teach you about the trade-offs that are involved in using different types of compilers for your Java applications and try to explain why the trade-offs are what they are and what you should expect when you try to do them, well, use different ones. Um, and the subtitle is from AOT to JIT and beyond. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to be um, transitioning into an explanation of how we're at uh, OpenJ9 starting to put different types of technologies together in order to address all kinds of different needs and do some pretty cool stuff. So I wanted to start off by just saying like the Java ecosystem is this amazing place to work on compilers. There's been an, a tremendous investment over the years, over the more than 20 years, in the Java ecosystem looking at JIT compilers, looking at AOT compilers, looking at um, JIT compilers that can cache their code and, and load it later. Um, I've listed a whole bunch of different projects here. Not all of these are still with us, but these are kind of a lot of the major projects that have been looking at compilation over the years. And these are only really the things that have been happening in industry and sort of very popular open source projects. There's a whole ton of work that's happened in academia. Hundreds of graduate students have gotten degrees looking at compilation in the Java ecosystem. It's this amazing place, but it's created a lot of stuff to think about. Um, if we fast forward to today, that long list of things is kind of um, crystallized into kind of four projects that are, that are kind of live at the, at the moment. So everyone's probably heard of this thing called Hotspot. It's, it's pretty popular in the Java ecosystem. It has two JIT compilers in it, C1 and C2, and they're, they're basically the default. Pretty much everybody is using these things. I work on a project called Eclipse OpenJ9, which is a Java virtual machine that was originally contributed by, or built by and contributed by IBM to the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, and it's now available for everyone to use. It has a JIT compiler in it that's very adaptive and has optimization levels that use uh, temperature as a metaphor. So we have cold, warm, hot, very hot, scorching compiles which is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> and historically, it's been uh, invested in AOT compilation from an embedded and real-time system space. So we come at the, the, uh, the problem of compiling for Java from a very different direction. Azul has a Falcon JIT, which is based on the LLVM project you've probably heard of. Uh, this provides an alternative high opt compiler to, uh, to C2. And it also has the ability to kind of stash compiles uh, on disk and reload in subsequent uh, runs, which I should have mentioned that OpenJ9 does too, <laughs> when I was talking about my own project. Um, <laughs> and finally, there's this project, uh, Oracle's Grawl compiler, which uh, has the distinction on this list of being the only one that's actually written in Java and compiles for Java, which is kind of neat. And since Java 9, it's been available as an experimental AOT compiler in this tool called JAOTC. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. And since Java 10, it's also been available as an experimental alternative to the C2 JIT compiler, so you can use it as a JIT. Um, there's also this creating native images um, uh, uh, option that they have available using their Substrate VM project, which takes a closed world assumption, basically it says, I'm not going to load anything uh, other than this set of classes and try to compile as small a native image as you possibly can. Um, that's an, a very interesting project. I'm not going to be focusing on that primarily in this talk. Um, uh, that's almost as much as I'll say about it in this talk. There was another talk yesterday where you could learn a lot more about Grawl and how it works. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to start off by just kind of comparing some of these JIT and AOT and caching JIT, say what I mean by these things, and, and talk about some of the trade-offs in using them. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we take JITs to the cloud, and, and, and I'll wrap up. So. As I've, as I've talked about before, uh, JITs stand for just in time, if you haven't heard the term before. <laughs> um, basically, this JIT compiler is active at the same time that your program is running, and so it can adapt to all of the, all of the things that are happening in the program as it runs. It can collect profile data, it can watch classes getting loaded, unloaded, etc. 
Um, it can adapt even to the platform that you're running on. So you ship around a set of class files, you can run those on x86, you can run those on ARM, you can run those on um, any kind of platform. Um, and it doesn't matter because the JIT compiler, which is the thing that's going to convert it to native code, runs at the same time the program runs. So you can defer the decision about what, how you compile code with a JIT. After more than two decades of sustained effort, JITs are really the leader in Java application performance, right? We've proven this time and time again. That's despite multiple significant parallel efforts aimed at AOT performance. The Java, because of its dynamic language nature, um, just lends itself very well to JIT compilation. And why is that? Well, there are a couple of reasons, which if you squint at them, they're actually really the same reason. But the first one is that JITs, JITs aggressively speculate on class hierarchy. So in the Java ecosystem, or in the Java language, calls are virtual by specification. That means they can be overridden by other classes. Um, and so when you're making a call to, a, to one of these functions, you don't really know what the target is. It could be anything. It could be a class that hasn't even been loaded yet. Um, and, but many of these calls, as we know because we've studied many, 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 many Java applications over many years, many calls really only do have a single target at runtime. And so the JIT can see that because it's watching the program run. It knows which calls have only a single target, and it can optimize for that. They can speculate that this one target that it's seen is only going to be this is, is only going to be the target, and so it can aggressively optimize that. It can inline the target of the call into the code around it, and then it can optimize that code and make it much faster. All right. Inlining is one of the great enablers in compilers, right? It allows you to see more scope of more operations, combine things with the context at a call, with the code that's inside the call, and so on. And that expands greatly by, by being able to inline. You can expand the scope of optimization. You can generate really great code. But um, because of this uh, dynamic nature of Java, if you compile too early, you can actually fool the compiler into speculating on something that's not really only, that doesn't only have one target. And so you'll end up generating code that's right for a while, but then in the real world, you have multiple targets and it's not right. And so the JIT has to generate backup paths that it can deal with, so it can deal with that situation when it happens, and that ends up having not great uh, code, not great performance until you've recompiled it. JITs also use profile data as the program is running. Um, so it might not surprise you to learn that not all code paths in your application execute equally frequently. <laughs> Some code paths execute a lot more frequently than others. And so the profile data that the compiler can collect while the program is running tells it which paths to focus on. Um, the simplest example here is that you don't have to compile every method in the program. If, it, if a method never gets called and, and only rarely executes in a particular run of your application, there's no reason to compile it, spend the time compiling it. Um, if it's only going to run a few times, you can run that in the interpreter and you can afford to do that because it's not going to run for very much. It's not going to consume very much of your profile. But something that's running and being called all the time, you want to compile that because you get a big benefit from compiling it to native code. Um, not all calls have a single possible target. There are megamorphic calls. They do exist. Um, but profile data can help you prior prioritize which one of those targets you might inline and then optimize the code around with it. So profile data can help you do inlining even for those calls that, that aren't monomorphic. And um, the third point is kind of it's, it's, a, it's a very efficient substitute in the JIT to profile data. You can, you can actually identify constants via profiling, not by having to do extreme uh, analyses of lots of code. You can imagine if somebody creates a constant and then passes it through a long call chain, for a compiler to realize that that's a constant, it has to see that entire chain of calls. It has to look at all of that code and make sure that the constant's really propagating all the way down to the uses. But if I'm profiling the use and I see that only one value ever gets there, I can be pretty sure that it's likely to be a constant. I might not be 100% sure, but I can still generate better code assuming that it is a constant. And so JIT compilers work really, really very well if the profile data is high quality. We've spent two decades making sure that that's true. And that's, that's why JITs get such great performance. But this advantage doesn't come for free. Obviously, collecting profile data is an overhead, for one, right? You'd, you have to spend time to do it. Um, and that cost is usually paid while the code's being interpreted, which means that's going to slow down your startup and ramp up, right? Which is something that people don't always like. <laughs> um, and if you need high quality data, 
that means that you have to profile for a while before you actually pull the trigger to decide to compile something. You have to wait until you've collected enough profile data to do a really good job compiling it, which also slows down ramp up <laughs> and startup. So a second um, part of this performance advantage that's not free is that there are resource resources being consumed by the JIT compiler itself. CPU cycles and memory, right? It takes you know, milliseconds to seconds to do a JIT compilation for one method, and it's going to consume potentially hundreds of megabytes of memory. Transiently, you're not going to see it for very long because JIT compiles tend to be short, but it's there. It's measurable. <laughs> um, and that cost is paid while you're compiling, and mostly you're compiling during startup and during ramp up. So all of these overheads are kind of um, coming to roost in exactly the place where people have problems with startup and footprint, or startup and, and ramp up, which is where you really want to get compiled code performance faster. Um, or they're interfering with the ability to get compiled code performance faster. There's also some persistent resource allocation. You know, you have to store profile data somewhere. You have to store metadata about classes somewhere. Uh, but for the most part, it's the transient stuff that really gets in the way. All right, so if I were to kind of collect that together in a kind of a scorecard for the JIT, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll assign a score for you know, steady state code performance, it's really great for JIT, so that's green. For, uh, it can adapt to changes at runtime, that's great. It's really easy to use. Does anybody know the command line option to disable the JIT? No hands, all right. <laughs> that's easy to use, right? <laughs> Nobody even cares how to get rid of it. <laughs> um, you have platform neutral deployment. So uh, you can, because you're compiling when the program's running, not when you're actually building. Um, however, as we've noticed, there's some issues with startup performance and with ramp up performance. Uh, I haven't defined those yet, sorry. Startup performance, uh, I call the time until an application is ready to handle load, right? So you spend a lot of time initializing data structures, getting stuff ready, and then eventually you're kind of ready to start accepting load or start solving the problem that you're trying to solve. Ramp up is the time after that until you hit your steady state performance. So you may not be able to immediately do things as fast as you'd like to, but eventually you'll get there and that's when you'll hit steady state. Um, and we also mentioned that you know, there's these runtime impacts to CPU and memory. So we'll give a, a red score for those things. And so I don't know how many people have come to talk to me about these things when they point, they, they realize these things and they say, hey, can't AOT help with these red things here? <laughs> we really don't like these red things. We want to start up fast, we want to ramp up fast, and we don't want to pay all this extra stuff. So let's talk about ahead of time compiled um, comp compilers. So the, the basic idea here, which you probably already, already know, is you introduce an extra step here at your build time to generate native code before you deploy the application to wherever it's going to be run. In the OpenJDK ecosystem, there's this tool called JAOTC, which is used to convert a set of class files to a platform-specific shared object. Uh, it's very akin to the approach that's taken with less dynamic languages like C or C++ or Rust or Go or Swift, etc. Um, it's currently still in the experimental. It has the experimental tag associated with it since JDK 9. And right now it's x86-64 platforms only, as far as I know. There are a couple of deployment options. So these are things you have to decide at build time before you deploy your app. And that's whether or not you want a JIT to be able to top up your performance on top of what the AOT code is able to give you. So you can have no JIT at runtime, which means you get you know, statically compiled code and nothing else. Anything else runs in the interpreter slowly. <laughs> um, or you can run it a JIT, uh, with a JIT at runtime, in which case there's mechanisms in place built into the code so that it can trigger JIT compilations uh, using C1 or C2 uh, in order to upgrade the performance and get closer to what the JIT is capable of doing. So you get faster performance plus you get the ability to, to get a higher runtime performance. Now AOT has some runtime advantages over, uh, over a JIT compiler. You get that compiled code performance immediately. There's no try to figure out, you know, watch the program, wait to figure out what methods are running a lot, put them in a queue, wait till they get to the head of the queue, run a compiler to compile it, generate native code, inject it into the running system, and wait for the next time for it to get invoked. Skip all of that stuff, right? You load it in your process, boom, you've got native code, it runs, everything's great. Um, startup performance here can typically be 20 to 50% better, especially if you're combining it with technologies like AppCDS. And it's going to reduce the CPU and memory impact of the JIT compiler, particularly if you use that first deployment option where there is no JIT. <laughs> but 
there's there's quite a few big buts actually. Um, you're no longer platform neutral. You have to decide which platform you're going to target when you're building it. And that means you could, because you need different AOT code for different platforms, right? And particularly you need to package it differently, right? The way you package a shared object or, or code on a Linux, Mac, and Windows are different, even if you're just talking about x86. If you brought other platforms into the mix, it would be an even stranger mix of things that you'd have to decide up front ahead of time. And you have to pick which processor you're going to generate code for, too. You can't necessarily say, target the latest and greatest Skylake processor if your code might run on something that's not a Skylake. <laughs> Um, you know, at worst, that might you might have some performance impact to that. But if you choose to use instructions that are only available on that CPU, then you're hosed if you try to run it somewhere else. You're going to abort, cause all kinds of unhappiness. And there are a few other usability kinds of issues too, uh, some of which are getting better as the ecosystem moves forward. But you know, basically, there's there's deployment options that you have to decide on build time, and you're kind of locked into them because those options de de uh, change how you generate code. So different GC policies require different kinds of write barriers and sometimes read barriers. And so <laughs> you can't just arbitrarily say, OK, I want to use G1 now, or I just want to use uh, uh, Z1, Z1. Sorry, I'm Canadian. I should really do better at that. <laughs> um, nobody's Canadian here, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, the ability, if you want to be able to reach it or not, um, you have to decide that on different platforms, you're generating even different sets of classes and methods. So one of the other things that you have to do when you're generating AOT code is you have to tell it which classes and which methods you want it to compile. And so on different platforms, that might be a different list because there are classes that only get loaded on Mac when you're running on Mac and some that only get loaded on Linux when you're running on Linux. I'm saying that repeatedly, but anyway, um, you get the point. <laughs> Um, and now those lists are things that you have to curate and maintain. It's all well and good to, to write a, you know, to do one study and try AOT and it works great, fantastic. But my application is a changing thing. And if I have a lot of applications, then I have a lot of things that continue to change. And so those lists of classes and methods are things that have to be curated. You have to maintain them. You have to keep track of them as your application's evolving. If new code paths are being created. New code paths are being activated. You have to remember to add those to the list and keep them there. And if there are things that are not, no longer used, you probably want to take those out of the list because they're not worthwhile being there anymore. Um, and then, of course, there's always the question about what classes, what about classes that aren't there until the run starts? You can't AOT compile it if you don't have it. <laughs> so, so there are some things that are that kind of troublesome from a usability standpoint with AOT code. And, you know, let's look back at all those, those two reasons that we had for JIT compilers to deliver excellent performance, speculating on class hierarchy and profile data. I don't have any of those. I can't do those because I don't know what classes have been loaded because I haven't run it yet. <laughs> So AOT compilers in their very pure form have to, like if they're not being combined with JITs, have to really reason about things that are happening at runtime because they're not at runtime. So let's take a bit of a side track into, sidebar, into that discussion. And let's look at the lifetime of some generic, hopefully matches at least somebody's Java application in the room. So things start off, you run Java and you have that big bang. The Java process has been created. Poof, it didn't exist before and now it exists. You have a process. A little while after that, the JVM gets loaded and initialized and, and you're about to load the first class and about to run main. About by the time you get to the point where you can actually run main, <laughs> about 750 classes have been loaded. And there's a, ha a handful of class loader objects that are live, and they're, and, and they're responsible for doing the remaining class loading that's going on. And now in this diagram, I'm starting to show a bit of an envelope. There's these two blue lines here, which hopefully you can see my pointer down here, um, which you know, the more apart they are, the more classes there are, and the more complex that those relationships between those classes are. Excuse me. So um, during this application, class loading and initialization phase, up to hundreds of active class loaders can be loaded and tens of thousands of classes can be in and can, can be loaded. So the if you're running a big Jakarta EE app, say, you can have lots and lots and lots of stuff flying around all at the same time. So you can get very large numbers of classes and a very complex 
class hierarchy that you have to be looking at. And finally, your application gets to the point where it's ready to do work, right? This is the end of the phase I called startup, right? Um, you're now starting to exercise the actual code paths that are going to be commonly used at runtime. Um, and you'll probably end up loading a lot, more class, a lot more classes now, which if you did too much compilation during startup, you're going to start invalidating some of the assumptions that you were making at that point. But eventually your code paths stabilize and your profile stabilizes and everything gets, everything's fantastic, right? And your ramp up ends and you're, you're in the world of normality. Now, real applications will go through phases and they'll go idle and they'll do all sorts of other complicated, nasty things. I'm not trying to show that with this diagram. <laughs> the, now, the, the JIT compiler, um, getting back to the topic of compilers, the JIT compiler is basically inside this process the whole time. And at any point in time, it knows exactly which classes have been loaded, where they've been loaded, how they relate to all the other classes in the system, regardless of which class loader loaded them, etc. It can see all of that complexity. It's right in front of it. But the AOT compiler has to view it all through the big bang of the Java process being created. It's outside of this whole process. And what that means is that AOT really has to predict all of that, all of that complexity that I just described, those hundreds of class loaders potentially, and tens of thousands of classes. How are those things all going to relate? It has to predict all of that. And that's really hard. All right, so what? <laughs> Great story. Um, <laughs> let's go through an example. So imagine two very simple classes here, uh, B and C, where C.foo calls B.bar, right? This looks like a very simple opportunity to inline the car call to B.bar, right? Bar just returns five, so I can take five and just replace the call to B.bar with five and optimize it with the code around it, right? Cool, that would be great. Um, but how did that actually happen? How did how did this connection between C and B get formed? Well, classes C and B got loaded by a class loader. Let's call it CL1. And when foo is running, it needs to figure out which B it is that I'm really talking about. If you look at the class file format for C, B is a string. It's not a class. It's not an identity. It's not which what are B superclasses. It's not anything. But it's, it's a string. <laughs> And it's the class loader's responsibility to take that string and say, ah, that's this class over here, class B. That's this guy. And so if you're compiling c.foo and you've resolved the constant pool entry for B, it will point to this class B and then you'll be able to look up bar and find out that it returns five and do this magical optimization that we all really, really, really hope happens. These class loader objects, they don't really exist anywhere but in the Java heap. They're just objects. <laughs> There's no um, concept of a class loader really outside of the JVM process. And so in particular, you can have other class loader objects, which can equally load class C and look up some different class B from that string that's sitting in B's and C's uh, constant pool. And that might look up some other B that returns minus five. And in that case, well, we probably better not in line five. <laughs> We'd better do the right thing, which is just call b.bar, right? And in fact, you might not even know what b is until you run c.foo, right? That line of code there, bb equals get a b, that might be the first time a b object got allocated in the whole program. So how's AOT supposed to figure all of this stuff out without actually constructing any of this? It's hard. And so, AOT probably has to hedge in this case because maybe only class loader one exists or maybe only class loader two exists or maybe both of them, right? It doesn't know what the scenario is and so it probably has to hedge. Now you might be saying that seems like a pretty contrived example. <laughs> I don't know, but it's actually modeled on how OSGI modules, are, uh, modules work, right? Enabling two different versions of the same library to be loaded at the same time, which, you know, we have a great name, jar file hell for that. We don't like it, nobody likes it, but it is a reality. <laughs> and there's nothing in the Java specification that says it can't happen. So you have to ask yourself, what prevents this scenario if classes can be loaded dynamically and even created on the fly? You just don't know. And that because AOT has to completely understand what's going on, it means it's probably going to have to hedge at these kinds of inlining opportunities. It makes it really hard for AOT to inline. And inlining, like I said, is a great enabler for performance. Now the JIT, 
it's acting at runtime. It can look at exactly what's happening. If it's only class loader one, great, I'll inline five. If it's only class loader two, great, I'll inline minus five. You got both of them? Fantastic, I've got two C's. And into each C of each of those C dot foos, I'll compile them independently and put five in one and minus five in the other. The JIT really has the advantage here. And so these hedges that the AOT compiler has to do really increase a gap, the potential gap between the AOT and JIT performance levels. And here we're talking about steady state performance levels. Now you might be thinking, okay, profile directed feedback, sometimes it's called profile guided optimization, PGO, maybe that'll help. Well, yes, maybe. Um, but, but AOT code has to run all possible user executions, right? The JIT gets the advantage of knowing the profile data in this run. And if you do a different run where it does something completely different, it will still get that profile data for that run and it will be able to optimize for it. But with AOT, you have to handle everything, right? Because you've only built it once. You, can't, you don't have the option to rebuild it for each runtime, or each, uh, each runtime instance. <laughs> um, and what that means is that it's really important to use representative input data that crosses all of the possible um, user data that you might have when you're dealing with AOT. And the risk is that it can be very misleading uh, if you use only a few input sets, which you know AOT compiler is gonna specialize just like the JIT would if it only had that profile data. It's gonna specialize for the, for the input sets that you give it. And if you give it something else, then you're gonna have lower performance. Um, that, that profile directed feedback approach can really lead the compiler astray if it's not representative enough. And you know, you know, we talked about monotonic calls where the call only has one target um, and that we've done lots of studies saying that calls are generally monotonic. Well, those studies were done 20 years ago, <laughs> a lot of them, on a benchmark called Spec 98, which was really just a bunch of C programs that got converted to Java. You know, it's, it's been borne out by lots of applications when you look at it inside the run. But when you look at it across all the possible input data sets, I'm not sure I'm as confident that it's always gonna be monotonic across all user instances. Um, that also means we have to be very careful with benchmark results when we're looking at AOT because benchmarks might not use a lot of different input data sets, right? So they might not, um, you know, they might not properly re reflect what you would really get using AOT. And so cross-training here is really, you know, critically important. It's very important in machine learning. It's very important for AOT compiling, right? You want to train, you want to <laughs> use PDF with one data set and try to measure it on other data sets to see just how good it's doing. And these input data sets are just like those lists of classes and methods that I talked about before. They need to be curated. You need to maintain them as your application evolves um, and as your users evolve because, they're, because the input data might change. Right? And all of that's really on the application provider. Right? It's on the person who's going to do the AOT compile and then distribute it to all of the different people who might use that, that uh, AOT code. And I'll make one observation that PDF has not really been a huge success for static languages. There are cases where it's been used and to great advantage, but as a general rule, not everybody's using PDF for, static, for statically compiled languages for a lot of these same reasons. And so you might think I'm pretty down on AOT here. Um, <laughs> and as a pure technology, I kind of am. Uh, so, you know, I'll be, I'll be clear about that, <laughs> right? If I put them back up on my, my scorecard, um, it's true that I turned all my red boxes green by using AOT, but at the same time, I changed all my green boxes red. <laughs> so that really didn't help me very much. Uh, I would call that kind of one step forward and one step back. Um, but you know, if I, if I were to combine AOT and JIT, like use AOT to generate an initial set of code and then recompile things with the JIT in order to get better performance, I can start to do a better job here. All right, so I still have a JIT, I mean, a, so I, I, I have a JIT running so I can get good steady state performance eventually. <laughs> I have a JIT running so I can adapt to runtime changes and what's going on, so I get a green box there. Um, AOT has all of the issues with curating lists of methods and classes and profile data that I mentioned, so I took off ease of use for that one. Um, uh, it's not platform neutral because I have to generate this AOT code and decide which platform precisely that I'm going to, or excuse me, which class of platforms I'm going to target. Um, but I get good startup, and then I get pretty good ramp up, because ramp up, you really need the JIT to take you all the way. Um, and um, 
Uh, but I have a JIT at runtime now, so I still have CPU and memory problems. All right. Is that as good as it gets? Well, not quite. I still have other tricks in my bag. So what I'm describing right now is pretty much the state of uh, OpenJ9 before it was open sourced in about 2007. So uh, the solution that we put out to accelerate, we use AOT code. Uh, basically, we generate it by the JIT. We store it in a cache, and we get um, we get uh, basically the, the kind of um, scorecard that I showed before. But caching JITs have gone further. We've gotten better at doing this. Um, so the basic idea here with a caching JIT is you have a JIT compiler running. Why not just take the code that the JIT generated and store it someplace? And then in another run, let's take that code. I don't have to compile it again. How many times do I have to compile string.equals? Really? <laughs> um, uh, and so this is kind of like a JIT and AOT mix here, right? So is it really different than AOT? Well, no and yes, right? From the second JVM, looks kind of like AOT, right? I'm loading code that's something else generated. I'm not compiling it. I'm not doing anything at runtime to use it. So I'm just going to load it and use it. So that looks like AOT to me. But the first JVM, that poor sucker, <laughs> has to go through that whole process of JIT compiling everything and generating the code and storing it in the cache. And on top of that, I have to generate a bunch of metadata to make sure that I don't screw things up in that second run. If some different class gets loaded or some different path becomes hot and, and used, or if classes don't get loaded with exactly the same relationship that I relied on in the JIT and optimized the code on in that first run, in that code that I stored away, I have to be able to catch that because you know that would be bad if I took code that was optimized for a scenario that's not true <laughs> in the current JVM and used it. Wow, would you guys be unhappy with me? <laughs> um, so we have to be very careful, and that, that has a bit of an impact on making sure that all of this works very well. But we do get to return to platform neutrality because even that first run where I'm generating that code, it's the JIT compiler. It's running in the process. It sees at least the profile of the user running that code. I don't, I don't have to generalize across all user, all possible scenarios. I can focus on one. And that usually is enough to get, um, to get good because not too many people like having different apps operating very differently all the time, right? That's just a, not a very nice system to work with, right? But different users are using different caches and so they get the benefit of, of the code being tailored for their environment. And it's happening at runtime so it's tailored for the processor so I can compile it on Skylake if I want to compile it on Skylake. <laughs> All right, there are two basic implementations of this that are available out there in the wild. One is a uh, technology at Eclipse OpenJ9, the, the JVM that I work on. Uh, we call it Dynamic AOT. Uh, no one will ever accuse us of being good at naming things. In fact, that comes up again and again in this talk, poorly named stuff. But anyway, that's fine. Um, this was originally uh, introduced a long, long time ago in the IBM SDK for Java, um, Java 6, in fact. Um, and uh, at this point, we've got it to the point where there's about a 5 to 10% um, possible uh, hit to peak JIT performance. And we're getting better all the time at that. And it's resilient to application changes. Azul also has a technology which they call compile stashing. Um, maybe we should just use their name because Gil's usually a lot better at naming stuff than I am. <laughs> However, uh, nonetheless, so Azul's Falcon JIT has this compile stashing ability based on LLVM. Um, it was intru introduced, um, I don't know if it's 2018 or 19. I'm not 100% sure on when it actually got uh, produced. Um, but it's kind of the same idea. You can store compiled code to disk. You can load it on in a, in a subsequent run. Um, there are some issues trying to make sure that this run completely matches the scenario that you were that you had in the previous run. So it's not 100% perfect, but they do JIT recompilations to get everything up to up to scratch. So it's, it works really well too. Uh, also resilient to application changes. So these things are all very Java compliant, right? They run uh, any Java application and get it right. Um, in OpenJ9, we really use cached JIT code to accelerate startup. That's been our primary use case for it. Um, we have an option called dash x share classes. If you turn on that option, you will share the memory for classes. You will save time trying to initialize those classes at load time. You will store AOT code into that cache that's been compiled by the JIT. You will store profile data. You will store hints to the JIT on what it should do going forward. And that population of the cache happens naturally and transparently at runtime. There's nothing else you have to do in order to make that work. 
Um, and you can name caches. You can put them in different caches, etc. There's all kinds of cool stuff that you can do with it. Um, right now, uh, very recently, actually in, in one of our recent releases, we turned it on for boot class, uh, cl bootstrap classes by default, uh, which is comparable to hotspot sharing classes in the, in the, in the bootstrap classes uh, by default as well. There's also an option, dash x2 and virtualize, which will use cached JIT code even more aggressively. Um, it will even use it to accelerate ramp up, not just startup. Uh, but there may be a slight performance drop that you'll see by doing that. The JIT can top it up, but, um, but you might still see a difference. So the, the graph on the right here shows uh, Tomcat starting up with OpenJ9. On the left side, um, if you completely disable all sharing, uh, you get, that's our sort of the normalized 100% uh, number. If you um, are using Hotspot, it's doing some class sharing by default. So you get a 19% boost using Hotspot to do that. Um, however, with the new change that we've made to the default shared class cache, there's actually a 28% boost that you get from using OpenJ9. By default, you don't have to turn on anything. Um, and then if you do take that extra step and say dash x share classes, um, you actually get a 43% uh, performance boost in terms of, uh, of startup performance for the Tomcat server. So it works pretty well. Now, if we add that to our scorecard, so we almost have great steady state performance. Uh, we can adapt to runtime changes. It's very easy to use. It's platform neutral. Uh, startup is great, except for that poor first run. <laughs> the ramp up is great, except for that poor first run. And um, in the second run, we get pretty good um, you know, CPU and memory because we're not doing as many JIT compiles in that second run. But that first run's still getting hit. So you know, that's kind of the downside there. OK, there's still some boxes there that are not green. That's kind of unfortunate, right? <laughs> Even for caching JITs. Well, I'm going to talk now about some of the technology that we're in the process of building at OpenJ9. And we're actually very close to having this ready for people to try out and use. Actually, it is ready for people to try out and use. It's just not in our builds by default quite yet. So the basic question is, what if the JIT became a JIT server? Right? We're trying to get rid of those transient resource requirements that are imposed by the JIT on the JVM client when you run your application because they're actually really hard to predict. Right? Who knows how much memory a JIT compiler is going to take in their Java application? Any idea? No idea. Right? Again, because the JIT is so lovely and transparent, you have no idea how to predict what it's doing. <laughs> All right, we got your back. <laughs> So um, let's, let's dodge the problem and take this unpredictable, random, transparent thing that we all love and move it somewhere else so that it can be random and transparent and somewhere else that we don't have to care about as much, right? Let our applications run nice and clean and, and we can probably have more chance of predicting what the memory requirements are for the Java applications that we write than for this JIT compiler that somebody else wrote and activates randomly in random times. <laughs> All right, so the basic idea here is the JVM is going to be doing some profiling and work to, to identify what paths need to get compiled, but the actual work of compiling those methods gets shifted off to a remote server. Oh, and then you have some wonderful orchestrator in the middle that handles load balancing and affinity and scaling and reliability and all that stuff. Gee, if only there were things that could do that for us. Hmm. All right, well, eventually they'll come along, I'm sure. Kubernetes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Istio, <laughs> lots of good things. All right, so what are the benefits? Well, we can get all of these you know, random, hard to predict, JIT-induced CPU spikes and memory spikes out of the client um, and, and get the performance more along with the lines of what, what you're familiar with in the applications that you're running. We can get that JIT server can connect to the client JVM at runtime, same time that the application's running. So theoretically, there's no loss in performance. We can use the same profile data. We can get the same class hierarchy information of that running process. It's still adaptable to changing conditions, so that's great. And the JVM client is still platform neutral. In fact, the JIT server doesn't even have to run on the same kind of machine <laughs> as the client anymore, in principle. And there's some reasons why it's usually still quite similar, but, <laughs> but in principle, you could do cross compiles. All right, could it really work? Well. Yes, I wouldn't be here telling you about it if it didn't work, right? That's a less interesting talk. 
All right, so here's a chart that talks about uh, a Java EE benchmark called Acme Air. It's modeling a flight reservation system. That's not super important, um, but it's using a JIT, the JIT server technology that we've been building at OpenJ9 and uh, in combination with Dash X share classes. So um, I'm showing the cold run on the left and the warm run on the right. And you can see the blue line is OpenJ9 using a local JIT. And the orange line is OpenJ9 using a JIT server to do its JIT compilations. And the JVM client here, I've backed into a little bit of a corner. I'm only letting it, it's running in a container and I'm only giving it one CPU and 150 megs of memory, which is pretty tight for this particular application, right? And you can see, even in the cold run, by taking the compile workload and moving it to a different system, and don't call me a cheater yet, um, taking, <laughs> taking this CPU load to do compilations out of the JVM client and to the server helps the JVM client start up faster, even in that cold run where, you know, that poor victimized guy who has to do all the work for everybody else and, you know, doesn't get the limelight. Even this cold run gets to do a better job. It ramps up faster, it starts up faster, and actually quite a bit faster, right? Um, on the right-hand side, um, the warm run, well, okay, it's not exactly a lot better using the JIT server, but it's as good. <laughs> and in fact, you do hit peak performance faster. And there's an interesting reason why. <laughs> um, the, when you're doing the cold runs with a local JIT, the, the JIT can't compile methods very quickly, which means its queue of methods gets very long. And we have a heuristic that says, when the queue is long, start downgrading AOT compilations and doing them at lower op level so I can chew through more of them and get comp compiled code performance faster, which is great, except that when I lower the op level, I don't get as good performance, which means I have to recompile a bunch of stuff. So if you can see, there's kind of this drawn out um, process here. It kind of gets to a point and then it has to do uh, some other stuff to get all the way up to peak performance, right? It has this delay in here. I'm looking at the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> um, here. So you, you get here faster because you've compiled a lot of AOT codes in your in, uh, AOT methods in your cold run, but then you have to do more sort of high opt compiles to get you all the way up. And those compiles end up happening in the process in the warm run to get you there. When you're doing a JIT server work, those JIT compiles move somewhere else. So the queue doesn't get long. So we don't downgrade as many things. And so we end up actually being able to compile all of the methods that are going to be used in startup and ramp up at warm at our normal op level. Mm -hmm. And so that means we get this nice straight line, boom, all the way up to peak performance uh, much earlier than what the in-process JIT is able to achieve. So that's kind of cool. Now, I have to be fair, these things are running on uh, two different machines, but with a direct cable connection. So kind of like the best option, well, I could have put them on the same machine, but, <laughs> but best option in terms of latency connecting these two things. Um, and I do want to make the point that Hotspot takes about twice as long as OpenJ9 with a local JIT to start up this application and to ramp up to peak performance. So, oops. So, um, so OpenJ9 is already great, and this makes it even better. <laughs> All right. Now, another example I'm going to show here is uh, running a different application called DayTrader 7. Now, this is a, a bit beefier Java EE benchmark. Um, which is uh, simulating day trading, stock trading. And here I've shown three scenarios where I'm, I'm backing this client application into an increasingly difficult corner, right? The left-hand graph shows one CPU and 300 megs. And you can see that, that it, that's really not, very, uh, not a very tight corner, right? Even the local JIT is able to kind of make enough progress on here. We get about the same ramp up and about the same performance. In the middle graph, I've reduced the memory to 256 megs. So, and the, the local JIT is now starting to have trouble managing the workload of compiling at the same time that the, the, the application is trying to do work. And what that means is, if the JIT compiler runs out of memory, it doesn't throw oom and take down the whole JVM. That would be stupid. Um, what we do instead is just bail on the compile, right? We can't do that compile at that optimization level. And so we'll back off to a lower optimization level, but that means lower performance. And so as you can see, the local JIT is starting to have a bit of a performance impact, whereas the JIT server, because it's still sending its compiles over there, it's, it's still able to manage things quite well. 
Now on the right hand side, I've, down, I've re reduced it even further to 200 megs. And now you can really see that the local JIT is struggling, right? It's having real trouble being able to compile methods. And so the, the throughput performance that results that it can that it managed to achieve, it doesn't fall over, it doesn't die, but it's not doing as, as well as uh, it was in the other scenarios. JIT server is doing just fine. Why is it a little lower? I'm not 100% sure of that. Something I'll have to look at. <laughs> So what this means is, is that you can start to be a lot more aggressive about how you size your containers once the JIT compiler has been taken out of the process. Now you still have to obviously allocate space and, and memory and CPU resources for the JIT server, <laughs> but, uh, but this simplifies the task of managing uh, your containers for your applications. All right, now I know what you're thinking, all of that's been dedicated machines with network cables and uh, who knows, but what about network latency? Isn't that gonna hurt startup and ramp up when all that compile stuff's happening? And will it really be practical in the cloud, right? The <coughs> title of the topic was jitting for the cloud, <laughs> taking jits to the cloud. All right, well, so we tried it on Amazon and it worked pretty well, right? So on the left shows um, the blue line is again, the OpenJ9 client with a local jit. And you can see that it has massive spikes in footprint on the left. Um, in order to do JIT compiles to get to its peak performance. Um, steady state, it's, it's quite regular, but the JIT server has managed to move all of that workload off onto a JIT server just fine, and we get this nice, clean memory footprint curve. Very predictable, very easy to deal with. In terms of performance, which is the graph on the right, you can see, okay, it's not quite as perfect as the other graphs that I showed, but it's not all that far out of whack, and we're still working on this. So we think there's still improvements that can get made. Now, why is this the case? Well, it's because we can trade bandwidth for latency, right? Um, yes, it's true that compiles take a lot longer to happen when they're happening across a network, but we can afford to do more of them at a time because they're kind of lower utilization even on the server. And we can afford to put more resources on the server if it's doing a lot of compiles and it can do compiles across multiple applications. It doesn't, you don't have to have one server for one application anymore. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You can have one server feeding a whole bunch of clients if you want. All right, so if we put that one up, I've got almost all of my boxes green, <laughs> almost all. So. Everything's great from a performance side. Everything's platform neutral. It's easy to use. Uh, we've got two stars now because it's the first run across a cluster of applications that are talking to the server the first time you try to compile this code. But you can send it you know, um, to any number of, of, of clients if they want it in principle. Um, the only reason why I didn't do the runtime CPU and memory a full green bar here is because there's actually still some CPU that gets consumed at the client in order to satisfy these JIT compiler requests. Turns out it actually takes quite a lot of CPU cycles to send memory, uh, send network traffic. Um, as a compiler guy, this shocked me because I thought compilers have to be like one of the most computationally demanding things that you could possibly do, right? Well, it turns out that sending network messages is actually even more intensive. <laughs> which I'm still unhappy about, but that's the way it is. If wishes were, anyway. Um, <laughs> so current status here is the code is fully open source at Eclipse OpenJ9 uh, and the project that it builds from Open uh, Eclipse OMR. It's now been merged into our master branch. So that's new for this iteration of the presentation. That hasn't been true before. All the code is in our master branch, but we're not building it in by default to the binaries that adopt OpenJDK quite yet. Um, we've introduced some simple options which lend really well to any kind of Java workload deployment, right? So uh, if you want to start the server or the client, you're still running Java. Um, there's an option, start as JIT server, which causes the JVM to start up as a JIT server, predictably. Um, and you tell it which port to listen on, and it listens on that port. And it happens like that, very quickly. If you're running a client application, you use the option to use JIT server, give it the port, send it the address and whatever command line options you like to run your Java application with. And that's it. It will do all of its compiles. I was gonna do a demo, but A, I'm a little bit um, late on time, and B, uh, 
I spilled water on myself in the panel. I walked into that TV trying to leave the room earlier. <laughs> so I figured, not my day to do demos. <laughs> so I'm going to rest easy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you pay the price for that. Um, <laughs> Um, our current focus right now is just on ensuring the stability of this code base so that we can turn it on by default in our builds for OpenJ9. And we're hoping that that's going to happen in our very next release, which is in early 2020. That will be all the 0 0.18 release. Um, and uh, because OpenJ9 as a JVM gets built into the same code base, gets built into every JDK release, that means that you'll be able to run JIT servers with JDK 8, JDK 11, and JDK 13 at that point. And actually, one JIT server can handle all three of those. And I'm now being told to stop, but I'm not quite done. <laughs> so I'll ask you to bear with me for a couple minutes longer. Um, we're really just at the beginning of this process with JIT servers. I think there's some really cool stuff that can happen here. Our primary focus right now has been just on implementing the mechanics to move this JIT compile workload into a separate process. Once it's there, there's actually a lot of very interesting things you can do, right? You can figure out how to do that work more efficiently, right? So that you can use one server to serve a whole bunch of different applications and not have to um, spend, if you have n JVMs, you shouldn't have to do n times the compile workload of one JVM. You should be able to do that more efficiently, right? Again, it's kind of that, how many times do I have to compile string.equals uh, question. Um, uh, and, and that's obviously a very good fit for you know, current trends towards microservices where you've got lots of JVMs and lots of JVMs that you want to run in small footprints. So that's a really good fit for taking the JIT out of all of those things and uh, compiling across them. Um, we can start using classification algorithms to try and categorize those JVMs automatically so you don't have to do very much. Uh, there's no user experience in trying to figure this out. We can make it just work the same way JITs work, right? Where nobody knows how to disable it because it's so ubiquitous and great. <laughs> we can even optimize groups of microservices together, right? And, you know, you, it, it, I think there's some really exciting opportunities to use this in, say, you know, CI, CD pipelines, right? You could imagine where um, even your sort of development experience is tied to, I know which methods changed in this pull request, so communicate that to the JIT server so it knows exactly which ones not to send to the thing, and then, you know, it can even start compiling those ones while you're waiting to run your tests, and then you just get your, your whole pipeline gets accelerated by this JIT server sitting on the side that's communicating back and forth. And it's even a good place where you can collect information, like imagine all the profile data, all the class information, everything that's inside the JVM, it's now sitting someplace that I can independently query. <laughs> I could find a way to present that data in the IDE maybe even, right? Start feeding back some of that information about how applications are running in your IDE because that server can live longer than your application does. It doesn't have to be there then. All right, I'm wrapping up, I promise. <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, Yes, quickly wrapping up. So JITs continue to provide the best peak performance here, but there are some really good op opportunities to do uh, even cooler things. AOT compilers, as we talked about, they're very interesting technology. They're starting, they're, they can improve startup performance dramatically, but there are some steady state performance issues with them and some serious usability issues if you were to just use AOT by itself. And that's why in OpenJ9, we don't just use AOT by itself. We use AOT in combination with JIT and now with uh, caching our JIT compiles and, uh, and starting to now go to JIT servers, right? Um, you can get to within five to 10% with caching JIT of, with excellent startup and ramp up, even for very large Jakarta EE applications, right? And I think there's still room here to improve both throughput and startup and footprint without sacrificing compliance, without having to go to a closed world model. Excuse me. It'd be very interesting to see if we can go, if there are any intermediate steps there between you know, full Java compliance and definitely not Java compliant. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a spectrum in between there. I think it'd be interesting to see what solutions we can build in that space uh, without having to sacrifice completely on, on Java compliance. And JIT servers are coming. Um, hopefully built into Adopt Open JDK in early 2020. If you haven't tried Eclipse Open J9 yet, I don't know what you're waiting for, but go to the site, adoptopenjdk.net. You'll get presented with a thing like that, a page like that. Make sure you pick Open J9 on the right-hand side here and try it out and let us know how it goes. Thank you. <laughs>